Welcome to the Spectrum of Health podcast. My name is Jav. I'm an online health and fitness coach. This is episode one. And today we've got a very, very special guest. Uh, she has her own podcast called Gen Teach. She's a GCSE history teacher, an A-level politics teacher. So she knows what she's talking about. Hey, Marley, give you a little clap. Hope you like that intro. I've been, practic- I've been practicing for a long time. Love it. It so was beautiful. Thank I'm, you. I'm glad you could uh, come and join me um, on my first episode. Yeah, I'm so privileged. Thank you. This is episode one. So, yeah, it's been... Um, when I was thinking about doing this, like, honestly, you was the first one I had on my mind. I did say that. I did say to you, but even when I was thinking about it, yeah. I was like, we need to do a com- have a conversation, and talk about, you know, kids, confidence, self-development, so on and so forth. And I think you're the perfect person because you work, you work with children, you know? Yeah. And I think that when it comes to like developing confidence and self-development and also how you feel about yourself, that is formed a lot in the early stages. Definitely. So yeah, um, first of all, how are you? Firstly, actually, thank you for that lovely intro and everything you just said. As I said, like I'm completely privileged to be the first guest on your beautiful podcast. So thank you. Eternally grateful. And I'm all right. I'm just happy it's Easter holiday. I am so glad <laughs> so time <laughs> away. But in saying that, I've actually been back to school every day since Tuesday. Really? Because I've been using their sewing machine. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, like it's been quite peaceful. Is sewing like a new thing that you've started doing or? Just, well, I always knew how to sew because my auntie taught me when they used to stay at hers okay. um, when I was younger. Yeah. But then there's just a couple of things I was like, you know what, I'm just going to like practice, put some things together yeah. in my spare time. Okay, so, yeah. Cool. All right, cool. So, um, you know, this podcast is all going to be about self-development, how people develop confidence, mindset, and it's going to be wrapped in with a little bit of health and fitness because that's what I do. So, you know, the the reason I really wanted to get you involved was to talk about, you know, kids mm. developing self, self-esteem and self-confidence in the school system, how that happens, the parent interaction, the teacher's interaction, so on and so forth. But before we get to that, I want to talk about you specifically okay. and how your experience in school kind of shaped you and... And I want to talk both primary and secondary school and how that kind of journey helped you become who you are now. Because, you know, if I look on your social media or so on and so forth, you're quite expressive. Um, You also have a page specifically for your teaching. But, you know, you're very you're quite open. You're you're I can see, you know, I can see elements of your personality. So how let's talk about primary school first. You know, how if you could like describe your primary school experience, how would you describe it? Discombobulating. Okay. <clears throat> um, that's, a big, that's a big word. <laughs> yeah, it's my favorite word at the moment as well. Um, I say that because I actually feel, in a weird way, primary is where I went through most of like my identity crisis, if that makes sense. Okay. Like, um, I don't know. Like when it came to the education part of primary, that was fine. Like that was okay. But I always felt some sort of conflict um, between like who I was and what was expected of me Mm. from different groups of people. Um, So for example, like my closest friends are always the people who weren't particularly that popular and people wouldn't really really like go to, to like speak to. But I would also really get on with those who were popular. So I kind of moved between these lines And I think that has had a positive impact in my like adult life and as a teenager, because I don't find it difficult to be in certain spaces with different people. But it is confusing because I suppose I never really knew where I stood. I was never comfortable with where I stood. Do you know what I mean? So it's quite hard for me to explain now and I don't want to spend like half an hour trying to unpack it. But one thing, because I go to therapy, one thing that my therapist said to me is you see identity as fixed that's why you struggle so much with certain things that happen because I see it as like you have to be one way you have to have one type of like you know way of being um 
And I think that is a massive impact from my socialization in primary school because mm. it was always like you're the weird kid or you know, it just I I never felt fixed. And yeah. I felt like that was problematic to me because then in secondary school it was like I was noticing every single person who I met was like, Oh, you're so weird all the time. Right. And that was strange for me because I was like, but how am I meant to be? So in my head, I think it, I process it in a way. It was like I'm weird. So therefore, like, I don't know. So there's something about my identity that isn't acceptable. Yeah. And that is definitely like my experience of primary school. So again, yeah. like education wasn't a big problem. I mean, I wish I learned maths better, but at the same time. That's everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I feel that my biggest hang up from primary is to do with like my identity and socialization. Right. So then yeah. with that being said, then <laughs> would you, if you could look back on yourself back then, would you describe yourself as a confident kid in primary school? Um, it depends what you're asking me to do. Okay. Because if it was something that I felt comfortable with, so gymnastics or like English, I was I was comfortable with, I'd be very confident, I'd be happy to do it. But then if it was something where I was like insecure, don't like I'd be right. very in my shell about it. Yeah. And I think that still persists again to this day. Okay. Yeah. So So what about from a social aspect, interacting with other kids? Mm. Was you someone obviously you mentioned that that sometimes you would get an identity crisis because, you know, you was around the cool kids, but you'd also be around kids that weren't necessarily yeah. the, the go-to people. Um, did that affect kind of how you interacted with those two groups? Um, do you know what? Not really, because actually in some way, when it came to like my bestest friends, like I said, the ones in yeah, the Yeah, close, you're close people. Yeah, I was like completely comfortable with them. So there was no reason for me to kind of, you know, like play with how I was around them but I think in some ways I would act in a way that I thought I was expected to when I was around like the more popular kids so yeah. elements of my personality that I'd be showing with my other bestest friends wouldn't necessarily come out when I'm with all those other people because right. I'd be like oh I've got to act this certain way right so you, I'm telling you my life story do you, like, feel, <laughs> do you feel like you couldn't always be yourself then yeah okay yeah because if I was myself, then that's vulnerable. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. I'd be putting myself out there for someone to like point out something that they don't like about me or yeah. that they think is weird or strange. Yeah. And because I found I didn't like that, I tried to avoid that as much as possible. But actually, it's really counterproductive. Yeah. 100%. Okay, cool. So then in elements where you felt insecure or you didn't feel so confident about doing something, Obviously, you mentioned certain subjects like like maybe you was good at PE or gymnastics mm. and writing, but not maths. How did you feel like, and this is about primary school specifically, how did you feel like the teachers and the staff, whether it's teaching assistants, whatever, like how did they approach that? Did they identify that? Were you able, did you feel like you was able to go to them? Were they, were they a good support system or not really? My teachers were old school. <laughs> So I was actually thinking of this the other day. They were so old school. Like, they were all in their 60s pretty much. Yeah. Like, near in retirement. Um, obviously had their proper old way of teaching. And whilst they were really supportive and you felt safe in their classrooms because they were stern, when it came to, like, that well-being stuff, wasn't it wasn't, there. yeah, it wasn't like, they were nurturing in an old school maternal way but not in a, oh, okay, I see this in this child yeah. and let's see how much we can bring out of it. Yeah. They were just doing their job as yeah. educators rather yeah. than like the whole picture. And that's not to say that they did a bad job because like I remember them very fondly. Yeah. But when it came to boosting confidence and stuff, they weren't like, that wasn't their main interest. Yeah. Okay. That's mm. interesting. All right. Cool. That's interesting. I mm. think that like when I even think about my primary school experience, like, I don't really remember much of it because I, I was just playing sports so much. But I think one thing you said that I feel like my thing is on the total opposite end about being with the cool kids, right? Or the more popular kids mm -hmm. is that I think I went the other way, whereas I just chilled with the popular kids and that was it. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think I mingled too much. I think I started to mingle more when I got to secondary school and I felt like I was a little bit more open, but I was still like, just my people, that's it. I didn't really mingle much. So 
that leads me to where we're going to take this secondary school. So that transition, like for me, I would, like when I went from primary school to secondary school, I, that was probably like the biggest shift in terms of how I was perceiving myself because in primary school, from like year four, year five, year six, I'm playing sports. I'm always with the older older kids. You know, you're like a big fish in a small pond. That's how I felt. You get to secondary school, you're a small fish in a big pond mm -hmm. and you're like, bloody hell, all these kids are bigger than me. The older boys, obviously, you know what the boys are like. They want to, you know, fight, blah, blah, blah. So for me, I think my first year, I enjoyed it because I found friends really quickly. And I'm always, I've always been a confident person. Um, but I think after a while, I didn't really enjoy it. And I hated, I hate, I didn't really like my school either. So like for me, I found going to secondary school enjoyable, but it was the biggest transition. It was quite a difficult transition. How did you find going to secondary school, that process, like your whole uh, secondary school experience? Oh, there is so much to unpack. <laughs> like, um, I don't know. I'm going to say my memories of secondary school from year seven to year 11 was like being in the jungle. <laughs> and obviously we went to the same secondary school. So you know what I'm talking about. Um, oh, I don't really know where to start, but I definitely think that my inner child persisted from primary school to secondary school. I think a lot of my issues were from primary still. Right. Um, so whatever was manifesting when I was in my teenage years was coming from the insecurities I felt when I was younger, but I didn't realise that. Um, so yeah, like when it comes to secondary school, again, my biggest, let's say, influence with how I felt about myself, my identity was the people who I was hanging around with. Mm. And that's when there was a bit of a difference. Like I started... In year seven, I had like a few friends. I can't really remember who my closest friends were. But then as I got older into year eight, year nine, whatever, I would be in those circles that were like considered more popular. And that was something different for me because obviously, as I was saying before, like I was with the other kids who were considered as like, they weren't outcasts, but, you know, they weren't the go-to people. Right. Um. So, yeah, it was quite... I think for me, I felt, I don't want to say proud of myself, but it was different when I was like, oh, I've been able to kind of navigate my, my way through the space and yeah. learn new things about myself and feel comfortable in places where I wouldn't normally feel comfortable. But I think when it comes to secondary school, a lot of things happened outside of those walls. Do you know what I mean? Right. So when I think about myself then, it's not necessarily, you know, what happened at school it's what happened Around when it. I was outside and you know what that's it's funny you yeah. say that because when just as you were saying that I was even having thoughts that like when I when I went to secondary school I felt like I was doing a lot more outside of school yeah. I think and I think that was that's related to being you know you're traveling to school on your own you get on a bus with all your friends other schools getting on the bus meeting other people from other schools I think that that plays a big part because like when you're going primary school, you kind of just maybe, you know, when you get to year three, year four, you might start making your own way to school or whatever, but you don't really mingle with other, I never really mingled with uh, primary school kids from other school, apart from if it was sports, sports related, mm -hmm. but obviously secondary school, you're on a bus with everybody, you know, people are, you know, it's just like a different environment, especially where we're from. So like, um, so how would you say things outside of school kind of affected you in school, if you know what I mean? Badly. <laughs> like rock bottom. Almost. Really? Yeah. I was a very naive child where I was kind of safe and cushy in my small community, as you were saying, like in primary school, in a way, um, going out into the big, bad secondary school world again as you said like where we come from I was not ready and I'm my only child so uh -huh. yeah I didn't have siblings to go before me to tell me oh watch out for these type of people or whatever else so when a few things happened I'm trying to think how much do I tell you <laughs> <laughs> um when I was 13 like something bad happened to me which was a lot 
at the time, I mean, now I could deal with it, but at the time I couldn't deal with it. Right. So it meant that I was pretty much in a state of depression. So I would spend so much time like walking around school, listening to my music and not talking to anyone, right. sleeping in lessons, not engaging with anything, just crying, everything else. Like to the point where my friends um, would like ask me to go to the house and they brought their older cousin to like speak to me because they were like that concerned. But I think one thing that I, I'm now really frustrated about is that was really visible and teachers didn't pick up on it. Yeah. And I know it's going to be like something that we speak about later on, but when I think about my experience in secondary school, I think about that. So it's quite a like off answer, but I just remember for a long, long time feeling just dire, like horrible. So how did that affect <clears throat> your confidence at the time? So bad. Like there was no self-worth. Yeah. No self-confidence. And it meant that I got myself into like really vulnerable and risky situations because like I just didn't see myself as worthy. Do you right. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and it meant that when it came to me working hard towards the end goal, that obviously I wanted to leave school with good GCSEs and whatever else, that wasn't a priority anymore because no one was kind of like nurturing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I say that actually, but I was in um a girls' group that was really, really good, but still I needed more from like the whole community rather than a select few people. Yeah. So then you kind of touched on the the teachers, the teachers thing. Do you feel like, so uh, sometimes I think that there is, uh, the teachers have a duty of care, right? So as a teacher yourself, are this, are you required to, if you identify something, are you required to like raise it to someone above you? Like, is there certain things? So what, what would you be looking for? in a kid who may have gone through something that you went through? Like, what, what is that? What do you look for? Change of behaviour. Okay. Like, the moment that child comes in and they are giving you attitude or they're withdrawn, something which is unlike themselves, that's when the alarm bells start ringing. I yeah. remember in my Manchester school, um, there was the sweetest angel. Oh, my God, she was just so lovely from yeah. year seven up until one day in year eight. She just went left, like completely. And from that moment, I was like, something might be going on here. And even though it was just a slight, like I roll, whatever else, then you can't, you can't ignore that. Yeah. Because that child could be being groomed. They could be having problems at home with whatever else. Like you can't just think, oh, they're growing up. So even if it's like the, the most subtle change in them, you need to keep them back and investigate or tell someone else that you're concerned so that yeah. everyone kind of swarms around that child. Um, just the slightest thing. So you feel like that in your, in your specific case, that could have been something that was missed or like overseen. Yeah. I just don't think they cared enough. Right. I think that like in the school that we went to, there were just so many children. Yeah. And because of my background was seemingly pushy, like, you know, my mom had, well has quite a middle-class job and whatever else like, I think the teachers just assumed that I was all right and that I'll get on. Yeah. But then also it makes me wonder, was there like racial ties behind it? Right. Because if that was one of the other children who were not black, would the teachers have kind of clocked on quicker? Would right. they have cared quicker? But I don't know. That's yeah. now, that's how we're thinking in the yeah. 2021, isn't yeah. it? Um, but I do think that they just didn't care enough. Yeah. So, okay, cool. So, that's interesting. I feel like in terms of the primary school experience compared to the secondary school, secondary school experience, um, a lot of outside influences affected how you felt mm. in secondary school in terms of, I mean, outside of the actual school itself. Yeah, I think um, the biggest change came um, in the middle of year 10. That is when I started to kind of like completely change my self-worth. Because I don't know if you remember that train wreck of a fight that we had. When it's like the whole school had, yeah. all the girls had a fight. Right? Yeah. And I remember I was holding back, uh, I won't say a name, but. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. After that, I was like, okay, no, nah, let me actually put my head down. Yeah. Um, And that's when I started to see more positive attention come from teachers. And yeah. that's when, like, specific people really kind of 
nurtured me in the right way, yeah. which so, I'm forever grateful for. So do you feel like, and it's just popped in my mind now, that like there is a little bit of, not lack of care, but you know, kids in inner city London going to secondary schools like the ones that we went to, I I can say for me, I felt like I hate I hated school, right? Mm-hmm. Not because of not because of anything socially. I just didn't like going to school. I didn't like being in a classroom. I didn't like being talked to. I just hated it. Yeah. But what I did feel, or what I thought of just now, is that like there is a little bit of there's no men- mentorship. Like there's no mm. there's no mentors. And I mean, we got teachers, but half of them are not relatable. Half of them don't actually come from the areas that we are, we kind of grew up in. So I, I felt for me, I never had like someone that would be looking out for me specifically or looking out for the group of boys that I was around. And you know, there's people that went to our school that's gone to prison, blah, blah, blah. You know, they've been involved in some pretty negative stuff, but they didn't have any, they didn't have anyone. Mm-hmm. And I think that, the school system obviously can't do everything, right? Can't it can't care for everything. But I do think that there is sometimes I think that there's a bit of an element where if you're not suffering with something in terms of like behavioral problems, mm. you kind of don't really get that one-to-one care. Because obviously the kids that have certain behavioral problems, they'll get put in like a special sort of special needs class or whatever that they get. But if you're like a good kid, but you still got issues yourself. You kind of don't. You don't really get anything. Like you, you kind of just got to. You get on it. Get on with it yourself. Um, so, do you feel like schools are missing mentors and that sort of element, or has it changed now since when? Since you was in school, I would say yes. The one reservation I have is obviously like I've only taught in two schools: one in right. Manchester, one in London. Yeah. And the one where I'm at now is like super progressive. When okay. it comes to that. So the staff body is young. Yeah. And um, not to say that everyone comes from inner city London because they definitely don't. But then I think amongst more staff members than usual in another educational setting, right? They are bothered about getting it right for our children. Yeah. Um, and obviously, like we're not going to be perfect. There's going to be mistakes in the way. But generally, people are interested in nurturing our children based on their background, but not in a patronizing way, but yeah. in the most helpful. But when I think about other comprehensive schools, I'm like, oh my, like, I actually <laughs> don't even know where to start. Um, and I think one of the really key areas where that's obvious is the curriculum design. Um, so I had a look at our school's new history curriculum. And with all of this, all of the discussion around like anti-racism, Black Lives Matter, and everything else, I was of the kind of impression that every single school was doing their best to make sure they were diversifying their curriculum, right? Mm. Especially if you're in an area with a high amount of children who are Black, Asian, other minority ethnic yeah, groups, right? Of course. Um, so tell me why you're doing chronological history, which is basically like British history from the medieval times all the way up to present. Whilst obviously like that has its value, it has its place, Rather than learning about Thomas a Beckett and who killed him and why, like... I don't even know who that is. Exactly. <laughs> like, that has no relevance to modern day. Why don't you mix up and have a look to see what's happening in the African continent in the 12th century? You know what I'm saying? But that's when I know, when you see chronological history or when you see, like, basic signs of a very whitewashed Eurocentric, like, pro-empire curriculum, and I say pro-empire with, like, inverted comments, comments sorry, um... That's when I kind of think, right, how far do your educators have your ch- your children's best interests at heart? Right. Because if you can't even do the work to represent your children in the curriculum that they will be going through from year seven to year 11 and maybe even sixth form, then how far do you even care about where they come from? Do you know mm, what I mean? Yeah. You don't care because if you did, you think, how do I show my children uh fair and representative history so that I empower them in the future to make informed decisions about the pathways they take, the conversations yeah. they have, the politics that they start to support, you know? You don't And I think it care. I think that also plays a role in even developing the white kids in a sense because oh, yeah. then they get to kind of see, all right, like we're all on a level playing field here. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think when it comes to racism and changing 
people's opinions and stuff, it, it it's for me, I think it starts with the youth, right? And I'm quite I'm quite an apathetic person. I'm someone that I don't believe racism's ever gonna end, right? Yeah. I'm just like I don't know. I, maybe I'm negative in that that aspect. I'm someone. I just think racism is always going to be here. Yeah. However, if you are gonna, if we're gonna make strides, it starts with the kids, right? Because they're the next. They're the ones that are going to be ruling the world for for years to come. So, if they get a full spectrum in terms of their um, history that they're taught, then they get a better understanding of the history of black people, Asian people, yeah. so on and so forth, and they can form better opinions. So. Cool. So we kind of touched on, you know, your sort of experience in school, how it's built you, your confidence, or how it's knocked your confidence in certain aspects. So as a teacher now, and you're kind of on the other side, you know, you teach history, you teach politics. How, how do you deal with kids? Obviously you deal with GCSE and A-level students, so they're quite older. Mm. So how, how is, sorry, firstly, have there been situations where you've identified kids who are maybe lacking in self-esteem, lacking in confidence? You don't, you can get in as much detail as you want. And if you have, how have you addressed that? Like, how do you approach that? What is that process like? Have you had to do that? You know, kind of touch on that for me. Um, I've had whole class loads. Okay. Like a whole, <laughs> a whole class of children who don't have confidence and I suppose when you when you hear oh that child doesn't have confidence you expect them to be quite timid mm. and like withdrawn and shy but actually when I think about the kids who have lacked confidence it's those who are loud disruptive in some ways you know will present with the most behavior management issues because they don't like that confidence, they don't want to be seen as vulnerable. Mm. So they so it's like up, a mask. Yeah, exactly. So, oh, <laughs> when I think back to one particular class, and I have so much love for them, like to this day, they were my first ever GCSE class. Um, they smelt blood from the minute I walked into that classroom, they knew that I was like fresh off the teacher training. Um, but I think that when it came to history a lot of them lacked confidence because of how let's say like technical it is um and we got through it it was okay but it made it really difficult to teach whole lessons for let's say two years definitely because there was a com there was a lack of confidence in let's say, well let's say a lack of resilience i think that's like one of the same thing right um where you have to like knuckle down so much, where you have to think in such a critical way, when that isn't something that comes naturally to you. And there's other people who kind of empathize with that in a quiet way. We're just going to like bounce off of each other. So the lack of confidence grows, but you mask it with camaraderie. Right. And you mask so the it bad with behavior is just spreading. <laughs> oh, when I tell you like, I've, I've, I haven't lost, yeah, I've lost it a couple, <laughs> a couple of times where you're just like, what am I actually going to do? With yeah. Them? But then, I suppose it's just about sticking around. Yeah. Just being there. Yeah. And challenging as much as possible, even if like every single time you ask them to stay behind and you feel like you've just been chatting so much rubbish and they haven't listened, it's going to be the same next lesson. Just that kind of consistency of, oh, I know what's going to happen now. Like, I know I have to do this because Mrs. said blah, blah, blah. That gets you a long way. And that confidence eventually builds. Right. And even if like they don't leave with a grade four or five, they still left with like a sense of, well, hopefully, I don't know if any of them watch this, I hope they left with like a sense of, let's say, achievement or community right. where and, they felt they've built in And they've some been way. supported, right? Yeah. Yeah, cool. And I think that's critical. I think that's really important. Because mm. even when I think to secondary school and I think of teachers who I think were supportive, you know, one person, I don't really want to, Mr. Barnett. I'm going oh, to just say Mr. Best. Barnett, right? <laughs> I think anybody who was in our school would say yeah. he was supportive. Yeah. Even if you didn't like him, you can't lie. The reason you didn't like him was because he was on your case because mm -hmm. he was so supportive. And I think as you get older, you realise teachers that, that were like that, you actually start to value them more Definitely. maybe when you're not around them anymore because they were like so on your case in a sense. So with that then, um, and you know, you've identified kids that may have not been 
um, as confident, they were lacking self-esteem, so that it's masked with bad behavior. Mm. How, in your experience now as a teacher, how long, how many years have you been doing that now? This is now my fourth year. Okay, wow. So with that then, how, how does, how does um, the parents, how do parents kind of play a role in that? What have you seen in your kind of experience? Um, how can parents be a positive or a negative influence on that? I think in some way, the bottom line is if a child wants to misbehave, yeah, they will misbehave. Regardless. Regardless. <laughs> like there's a couple of parents even to say, I have them on speed dial. Like I will just be able to call them up quick. And we could be having conversations like twice a week, every week. Like that's just how it will be. Yeah. Um, and the behavior might still still persist. But I think again, it comes with that kind of attention and support that that child knows they're getting, that they kind of thrive off of that communication yeah. in a weird way. I don't think they realize that. Um, but definitely supportive parents are a massive key. Like yeah. they are foundational. Like when parents are not interested and when they enable their children to slack and when they enable their children to like stay off school and not do their homework and whatever it is. Uh, it, it's noticeable. Like, it's noticeable. There's a difference. Yeah. Like you're fighting a losing battle. Almost yeah. Because there's nothing you can do. You've exhausted all of your like tools. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the last point of call or kind of is like talking to the parents. And if they're just like, oh, I don't care. I can't get him out of bed. I can't make her do this, blah, blah, blah. What else have you got? But you know what? In a way, right? Do you ever feel like, is there ever a point where your kind of influence becomes greater than the parent? And I say that because when I think about a day, like the amount of time I spent with teachers, mm. I could argue that, well, I'm not, maybe not with one teacher for more than I am with my mum or my dad. But, you know, if you're at school from eight to, to four, and maybe you go after school club or maybe you do some sort of extracurricular activity. Mm. I only see my mum for maybe five, six, and I'm in bed by nine, 10. Yeah. And I'm up in the morning at seven. I actually don't really spend any time with my mum apart from the weekends. So really I'm with my teachers more than I'm with my mum. So do you ever feel like you're, you ever get your your opinion and your influence ever becomes as powerful as a parent or nah, that's, that doesn't happen? I think so. But also, I think we're missing a very important part of the equation, which is friends. Okay. There yeah. You go. Yeah. So, like, when I think back to what you said is completely true. But again, when I think back to being a teenager, my influence on my friends. Right. And then it's not until later on when you leave school, you're like, oh, that teacher said this to me or did this for me. And that had a massive impact. You know what I mean? Mm. At first, it's like your social circles and what's... Especially now they've got Snapchat and they've got like the social media is mad up. now. It's, it's different. Yeah. A lot. I mean, we had what do we have? Blackberry. Blackberry Bebo, Bebo. For a little bit. Yeah. Um and then Facebook kind of came in. Yeah. 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 And yeah. then it was Insta. Yeah. But then they've got everything. Yeah. Everything now. So a lot of their kind of influences do come from within themselves. Right. But in saying that, you've actually raised a really good point. I don't think I've actually thought of deeply before but I do think that students come to you for what they know you not what you're good at but they can trust you with yeah. or your strong points so I think there are many instances and lessons and everything that have seriously impacted and do seriously impact the children to this day yeah. like and I don't know how far they'd be able to like identify that themselves. And I, I can't say for myself because that needs to be a conversation that we have together yeah. like as um, teacher to, to students. But I think so. Teachers are a massive influence. Yeah. So then um, what about, what was I going to say again? I've had a brain fart there. I've completely forgot what <laughs> I was going to say. Um, so then, oh, so then in terms of like when a child like the influence that you have on a kid, right? And their confidence and how they perform academically. So before, when I knew I was going to have you on, obviously I did a bunch of research, a little bit of research, just <laughs> trying to find some stats and stuff. And one of the studies that I did read mentioned about, um, there's like a clear correlation between kids who exhibit confidence usually have higher grades. But one of the things they couldn't link was whether it was the grades that um, influenced the confidence or whether it was the confidence that influenced 
the the grades. So what was the causation factor, mm. basically? Um, from your experience, what would you say? I want to quickly jump in and say, yeah. for me, I was never someone who lacked confidence, right? I don't know why, but as a kid, I think it was more related to because I played sports, but I never ever felt like I couldn't do something. And I still feel like that to this day. Yeah. Like right now, even though, you know, I never achieved my dream of becoming a professional footballer, I still play football semi-pro in my mind I'm thinking you know what if I really dedicated myself I could probably still go pro like yeah. that's my mindset so I've just always been in in school I've never felt like I can't do this I can't do that whether it's art music like, I've always had that obviously yeah. not everyone's like that so do you think so for me I can say my grades never influenced my confidence I think my confidence just influenced my grades do you what would you say you've seen because obviously you're in a school system so you see it more than me what do you think? I think it depends on what criteria we're judging confidence by. Right. Because confidence isn't just one thing. Right. It's a multifaceted thing, right? Right. So I could say I've got children who are so confident, but they're not confident with academics, they're not confident with writing. Right. So I can't judge because okay. they might be confident, which I know for a fact, year 11 girls are confident with playing netball, they're sick. But then I know that like sometimes confidence with, with writing essays, that lacks. Mm. So I suppose now with confidence, I think what the scientists should probably do is kind of like map out what areas of confidence they mean. Mm. So if it is a thing where it's like academic confidence, then um, of course the grades will impact on that. Because if you're seeing you're getting level five and above all the time, but then you're like, right, I can do this. Like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But if you're seeing you're getting ones and twos, you're not going to be confident academically. Yeah. But then in other things, like, I don't know, like social circles and whatever else you are, but we can't say confidence is just one thing. Right. Do you know okay. what I mean? Yeah. So it's quite, yeah. I, I understand why, you know, I see what the hypothesis was, but. Okay. So that, that leads me to another thing that I read before having you on here. Yeah. So also I had to do my research. <laughs> there was, so, you know, in school, right? In secondary school, you get put in sets. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna. So for me, I remember when I moved schools and I came to Sejil, right, and I came to the, to a new school. Obviously, I had good grades for my other school, mm. but I was bad, badly behaved. I've gone to this school, put me in the school, blah blah blah. I mean, top set for everything, maths, English, but they put me in like bottom set for physics or something like that, one science class. And I remember. Do you remember? I'm saying everybody's name, but do you remember Mr. Boyd? <laughs> <laughs> so so I remember he did a physics class and I've gone in the class and obviously the school Sejil's right next to my house right so I know most of the kids even though I just got there I know most of the kids from primary school so I'm seeing some of the kids in there and I'm thinking hold on <laughs> like, this why am I why am I here these kids are not if we're in sets I'm not supposed to be with these kids yeah. That could be arrogance. That was probably my bit of my confidence there. Like, I'm not supposed to be in there with these kids. So I remember I was in the class and I wasn't doing no work. I said to him, I'm not supposed to be here. Gone to Mr. Barnett about five times. Like, I'm in the wrong class, you know. Yeah. You got me in the bottom set. You know I'm a I'm an A-star kid. Like, what are you doing? I had to fight to uh -huh. get put in the in the top in the top set. Because I've when they were saying to me that you're in the third set, I didn't realize that you can only get a C. So there's like foundation. I didn't know all of that stuff. I'm just thinking, oh, everybody's got a chance to get an A. They're saying you can only get a C. Yeah. So I'm in my mind, I'm like, no, nah, yeah, this ain't right. Like this is already something's wrong. So like, how do you, so what I read, sorry, I went on a tangent there, but what I read was that um, basically putting kids in sets actually ruins their confidence because they feel like they can't actually achieve and this is particularly for the kids in the lower sets, they feel like they can't achieve um, what the other kids are doing. I would say yes, but I'd also say it's down to intrinsic value as well, because the same thing happened to me with English in right. year 11, right? Do you remember Miss Bramble? Not really, but... Oh, she was so funny, but she was meant to be our English teacher from like year 10. She got sick, so we not come in. So from year seven up until year 11, I had not had a proper English teacher. Right. So... Obviously, my grades were not going to be good because I've just been like messing about in English, not really learning much. Um, but I knew that English was one of my strong points. So I got put in a foundation class um, in year 11 and I was like, there's no way I'm leaving school with a C in English. Yeah. Um, 
So again, I went to the head of English and I was like, I'm in the wrong class, blah, blah, blah. I had to cry in the end. Like I had to actually like <laughs> shed tears. And I don't know if you remember Miss Noisy. She was like proper stern. And you I'm wouldn't... so bad at it. Oh, I remember a lot of people with me, but um, even she was like, there, there, like outside in the, in the playground. Um, because the excuse was there's not enough space and there definitely was enough space. Yeah. It was upset. Yeah. In the end, I didn't finish my English exam. I tell the story all the time. But I didn't finish my English exam and I got one mark off at A star. So like I went to the head of English, I was like, look what I've got. I bet yeah. he was like, Oh, imagine if um I kept you in that C grade class. And I was like, Yeah, imagine. Yeah. And I felt so proud of myself that time. Right. But I think for me, when I was in that situation and they weren't moving me out of that class, I was just like, there is no way that I'm just gonna sit here and take this i worked so hard right it pushed you yeah it pushed you because when you know you're working something when you're sure of that regardless of the situation that someone else puts you puts you in you're gonna go for it you're gonna be like no i'm proving you wrong it's only when you you go into that situation with a lack of confidence that it will spoil your confidence so how do you think now as a teacher when you see it the kids still get put in sex um sometimes it depends what your curriculum how how do you so from an external point of view outside looking in mm. does it still do you think that it still affects kids from a teaching perspective i don't mind sex okay because for me it makes it easier for me to actually like deliver a better lesson is that because of the behavior um. <laughs> you could, I mean, cuz if i'm being honest when i when i remember like when you you know that when you're going into set free with the bad yeah, kids it's yeah. like the teacher can't do no work the teacher well, how can the teacher do work everybody's doing Everybody's messing about. Yeah. No one's listening. Like, yeah. it's just not possible. Well, all of my high stakes classes, like GCC and stuff, have been bottom set. Okay. Like, at the moment, I teach mixed ability, so it's, like, fine. But in my old school, bottom set. So you you was dealing with a lot. Yeah. So I, having a top set for me is a privilege. I'm like, what have I done to deserve this? Yeah. Um, But I actually think that lots of other teachers will probably disagree with me, but it makes it easier for you to be like, okay, I know that. I'm trying to get everyone up to a grade four. Mm. So this is what we're going to do today. We're just going to practice knowledge retrieval and that'll be fine. Or we're just going to practice paragraphs and that'll be fine. Whereas when you've got a mixed ability set, whilst it's like good for fostering discussions, like I've had some wicked discussions with um, my year 11 class. Yeah. When it comes to like teaching those specific skills, it can be really difficult. So what you end up doing really, unless you've got some really resilient um, students in your class sometimes you just teach to the middle and that right. doesn't necessarily do what you need to do for those who can get the sevens to nines because you're also trying at the same time to get the ones and twos up to threes and fours or fours and fives sorry so obviously like you can do it it's not impossible otherwise it wouldn't exist yeah but personally I just think it makes things difficult whereas if I know I had a class full of like my sevens and nines we could be doing crazy stuff right. and they wouldn't complain because you wouldn't have one side of the class being like okay i'm just gonna write these three paragraphs and the other side saying why are you trying to make me write sentences on my own right. do you know what i'm saying yeah so, so you can morale. deliver you can yeah. deliver more which then in turn makes them actually more confident anyway yeah. and they feel like a, they feel better about doing the work that's it but i think yeah. with that again though it does depend because a top set will always be like with top set. So I'm just going to smash it. Anything my teacher tells me to do, um, I'm going to do because it means I'm capable because I'm yeah, top set. Yeah. But then with the bottom set, the impact is I'm bottom set. So it what's gives the point? a shit. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's but true, yeah. yeah. So, so it depends. It's kind of mixed, right? It's yeah. Tricky, yeah. Yeah. Because I, I can imagine that. I can't, I, like, just like we said before, right? When you get put in a bottom set, because we know we shouldn't be there. Yeah. Our mentality is like, I need to, I'm, this ain't right. I need to get out of this. Like, yeah. Whereas other kids, they get put in a bottom set. I, I, like kids who are supposed to be in the bottom set get put in a bottom set. Mm. And they're probably just a bit like, well, I'm here, innit? I'm, exactly. Why would I? I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to do anything. So I think that definitely has a bit of a um, effect on a kid's confidence. But then I kind of, we'll kind of double back a little bit and go, in towards how the parents can affect that because obviously I read, done my research again. And I read a stat that said something like um, 86% of teachers noticed a correlation between uh, a child's academic ability um, based on the parents 
input. So parents who were more, um, had more of an input in their child's learning, those kids were more likely to do well. Um, is that something that you saw? Yeah. And even from me, like I can say, when I think about some of the kids that were in some of the bottom sets, right, that i would known and I realized that, you know, they come from dysfunctional families. And some of these people I didn't even know until I got older and left school, that some of their home situations just were crazy. And like, even when I think about myself, right? Like my mum, I think my mum, she just had such confidence in me that yeah. she never really bothered me about school. And my dad, my dad, I think the same, like, he will call me in that, but we never really spoke about school. They just trust me to get on with it, mm -hmm. um, which for me, I prefer that because I'm someone who likes freedom, right? I don't want to be. But do you notice that? Like kids who their parents are very heavily involved in their education, like they do better? Definitely. Yeah. Can I also um, make a comment on what we were talking about before? Yeah. When it comes to bottom sets in any class, ultimately it comes down to classroom culture. So that's just like what the teacher does to make sure that they're safe and yeah. everyone's happy but we'll come back to that later um but yes a very important part of the puzzle is that parental engagement and i think one of the key things any parent can do is make sure that the environment is set up for your child mm. so it's really hard it's really really hard to make a comment on this sometimes because you just know sometimes people don't have the living situation to have that space or to create that they don't have the time maybe the parents work nights and whatever else there are so many things against you know that progression that engagement yeah um but i think one of the things is okay i know that between the hours of i don't know six and eight maybe we can just designate like this one room to them so they can do their homework and then maybe we can have dinner at like regular time so that there's a routine there maybe i can create a revision timetable for my child that goes in the fridge and I make sure that I hold them accountable to meeting all of that and I check as well. Um, again, if a parent works nights, it's really difficult. But then like maybe finding creative ways to have someone else check in on that mm. child as well. Um, also just having those positive nurturing conversations where you genuinely like just check in, how was your day? Yeah. You know, what actually was, talk about yeah, school. Yeah. What 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 was your favorite subject today? What was really yeah. annoying you today? What can we do to like sort it out? You know what? As you say that, I'm having flashbacks now, right? Yeah. So obviously, um, as a kid, um, I, I played for Crystal Palace, right? So we would train Tuesdays and Thursdays and my brother would pick me up sometimes because he's mm -hmm. 12, year old, 12 years older than me. Mm -hmm. So he got, got quite a big age gap. And sometimes when we're driving back, we wouldn't even talk about football. He'd ask me about school. He'd be like, what'd you learn today? Yeah. And sometimes I turn around to him and be like, I didn't learn nothing. And he'll be like, you was in school for six hours and you didn't learn nothing. <laughs> yeah. And now, now as an adult, I can see why he's asking me these questions, mm -hmm. isn't it? Because my mum, my mum's busy. She, she works nights. Yeah. My mum literally works nights. So the, what you're describing, my mum was doing that. Mm -hmm. So my mum works nights. I've got two older sisters, one older brother. My oldest, my oldest brother obviously is driving me around, helping me with football. And he would always ask me, like always ask me as well, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, nothing. Cause in my head, the reason I would always say nothing is I was smart anyway. So I didn't, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like I didn't learn nothing. I knew this already. <laughs> that was my mindset. Yeah. So he would be like, he'd be like, you know, like, what did you learn today? And then if I say nothing, he'll be like, okay, so what classes did you have today? He'll try and like mm. break it down a little okay. bit. So like, no, what you said there is is really, really important. So, but then you mentioned about, you know, mum or dad working nights, not actually being able to, to attend to the kid to the level that is probably needed. Mm. So would you say, you know, you've worked in Manchester and London, yeah? Mm. So there's a big thing about classism, how class affects kids, so on and so forth. How much would you say that is down to the the background, whether it's you know the uh, financial, so on and so forth, working class, middle class, so on. And... In terms of parental engagement, yeah. Oh, um, this is a big question because I think there is, especially where I taught, I taught in a place called Wivenshaw, which anyone who comes from Manchester will know 
what I'm even going to say within short like is that like a good uh, it's a place where rich area poor area it's a poor area okay um it used to be known as um the easiest place to get a gun okay so it's pretty yeah. rough pretty rough part of Manchester yeah which for me when I when I started I was like okay sick let's go um I didn't let like, I didn't let that phase me. I was like, yeah, oh, of course. I'm Jewish anyway, yeah, so yeah, it doesn't really yeah, matter. From Southeast London, so yeah, <laughs> it's normal. Exactly. I mean, it was challenging, but still, it was like kind <laughs> of like normal-ish. Um, I think there's this perception though that when you hear working class, you then think like parents don't work hard enough. There mm. were benefits mm. like drugs, whatever else, and actually, that's not the case. It's like very difficult to to say that like class is. A massive factor and I, I think yeah it is in some ways it depends what the household actually is like individually because there are some working class households where the parents work extremely hard we know that right so we can't say then it's a class issue because the next door neighbors might kind of not do the same as the others that doesn't we yeah. can't brandish people in the same brush you know what I'm saying yeah so, I think it's an educational value thing and the experiences that those parents have had mm. in school and outside of school yeah so if that parent is already feeling like disenfranchised and feeling like they didn't have the best experience with school um and there's nothing outside of that experience that has like led them to believe anything else or be hopeful or faithful in the education system then how are they going to properly support their children not in a way where obviously some people some people might neglect but like where oh i've lost my my train of thought Basically, like, they're not going to particularly have the educational value to pass on to their children. Right, if they haven't yeah, been if they through haven't, it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. If they haven't been through that themselves, and if there's been nothing that shows them are actually, like, going to school and focusing and whatever else is a positive thing, then how are they going to be equipped enough to pass that on to their children? Yeah. And it doesn't just start from secondary school. Obviously, it starts from, like, early years. Yeah. You need to be reading to reading to your children. Yeah. You need to be fostering that like value in them yeah. from day one. So if you haven't done that, and then all of a sudden school's burning your line saying they're not doing this in maths or whatever else. It's harder, yeah. yeah. You're not gonna get anywhere. And it's interesting that because like when I moved to America, um, there was a big deal. There's a big deal on kids who are like first generation graduates and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And I think that I never ever thought about that because my sister went to uni. Both my sisters graduated uni. My dad, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I think he went to uni. I don't know. So I should ask him probably. But like, they all went to uni. So for me, you know, I, I never really thought about going to uni. I never thought, oh, if I go uni, like, well, I never felt like going to uni and, and doing it was something that I didn't deserve to do. Yeah. I wasn't worthy of doing because I had people that did it before me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So when I went to America, I remember I had a really, I got I got a really close friend and he was the first in his family to go get a degree. So like, and that was a big deal. Like that's a big deal over there. And they place really, really high value on that. So yeah, that's interesting. Cool. Um, so go on. Sorry. No, no, go. Um, no, I was just like reflecting. And I think that I was, when you were talking, or when I was saying, um, the parent needs to make sure that the environment is set up for their child. Like I do come from a, a very privileged position where my mum could do that for me. And I was going to say things like making sure there's food to eat and like breakfast. Right. My mum used to bring me breakfast in bed, which I realised is really... <laughs> like, that my mum is... does, also does it now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, to that level, you don't have to do. I think it's because she knew that I was lazy and still am lazy AF, so like needed to actually get out of bed. Yeah. But just those little things there. And what you were saying about like going to uni and all of that, for me, it was like, I'm going to be the first person to do it. Right. So I need to do it and I need to go to a Russell group. That was just like the way I was set up as well. So yeah. it does, it's all about the conditions of your family because if I had people who went before me and they were all lawyers and whatever, would I really care? I don't really know. Yeah. So yeah, I agree with that. And it is a big, it is a big thing of like nature versus nurture yeah. in the sense that like for me, I I can't say 100% that if I grew up in a different environment, I would still be this super confident kid, someone who just has this crazy belief in myself. But I do think that a little bit of that is just 
natural to me as an yeah. individual, but I do think my environment sort of encouraged that because I had a big brother who he was super just like, he just made me believe in myself. Even though I always believe in myself, he just continued that encouragement with the things he would say, mm. whether it's football, like life, like having a big brother for me was, and the more I think about it now, it was like really critical. Yeah. And I've got a nephew who's 14, right? And I think that I'm, I'm not his big brother, but I treat him like a little brother. Mm. Like I'm on his case. I'm always telling him you need to do more. And sometimes he might think it's harsh because I'm really harsh on him, mm. but I'm harsh for a reason because I know that that support is critical. Like it's so important to have that. Um, and it is mm. quite interesting. So we kind of talked on it a little bit, but you would say, so you would say then that like, when it comes to class finances and just like, um, the, the background of, of, of a kid, you know, I think the statistics show that kids who come from disadvantaged backgrounds are, they're less likely to go to get their A-levels and get their, get, get a university degree, so on and so forth. So how, how does a, how does a family who necessarily the, the, the parents can't always be around cause they're working, maybe single parent households. Cause that's what I grew up in, you know, um, how, what can parents do to firstly instill confidence in, in those kids? And, you know, you know, you don't have all the answers obviously, mm -hmm. but you know, like what, what, what would you recommend? Like what could be done for kids that are coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, maybe similar to places like that, that we're from, um, like what can be done to help these kids e elevate them and make them have that confidence and self-esteem and self-worth and to excel in the classroom and outside the classroom? I think this, uh, I feel like I'm just not really given all the answers that I wish I could, but I think this is a bigger problem than the parents. Right. Because I'm thinking like, without a doubt, white working class, especially boys, are underperforming alongside yeah, they're struggling. black Caribbean yeah. boys. Yeah. yeah. And that's, you can't, you can't disagree with that. Yeah. Um, but when I think about all the things that would help nurture those like two groups in particular it starts it starts with actually like enabling the parents to do that right so it's the things like worldly experiences going outside of your area interacting with other people unfortunately a lot of that stuff the government or whatever else has been taken away like yeah so even as simple as like short start sentence where like early ages like you're able to socialize your children interact with other parents and whatever else that's gone. Yeah. Um, having the ability to like take your children on trips up to the city centre or wherever it is, maybe to London if you're from outside of London, to actually see the world around you to gain like a different experience. That is important. And I think, again, I'm speaking from like a privileged position where my mum was able to do that. So I knew there's so much out there to get. Yeah. But then I think from working with some other groups of children where they haven't really had the opportunity to see outside of that bubble what else is there to live for than what you're seeing right. do you know what i'm saying and if uh, when it comes to a lot of or not a lot of like a few children they might be growing up in households that are really dysfunctional whether it's like to do with domestic violence or anything like that where you know families have been like dislodged you know there is trauma there yeah so how if a parent can't support their child emotionally because they're also going through trauma, they're also going through something that is beyond their control, then what can you do? Yeah. That isn't something that, okay, the schools, the local council, the government essentially can enable you to like facilitate. Right. So, and yeah. So would you say there's just some situations that are just helpless? Like yeah. there's, not, there's not much that can be done. Mm -hmm. But it's also one of those things where, like, I'm talking about in the most, like, tragic circumstances. Yeah, yeah, of course. Whereas if you were just, like, a parent who is present, can be present, you might not be working or whatever, you definitely need to interact and get to know your child. Yeah. Just... So what, what are some of, like, in, the pra in practical terms, mm. 
for parents, let's say, who aren't in the worst situation, yeah. what are some of like the practical steps they could do? Like, what are some things you'd recommend? Like, I don't know, like reading every night or giving them a task to do, making sure they're doing the homework. Like, what would you say? As we said, start with conversation, you know, get to know your child, what's going on in their lives. Then make sure that there's food to eat. Uh, that's difficult given the circumstances, but if you can, make sure there's food to eat. Yeah, that's, make sure that's that you, Yeah, yeah. Like, make sure that um, you are encouraging them to read and for pleasure, not just for homework. Pick up a book and find one. Like, even if you read the first few pages of 10 books until you find the 11th one that you like, read it. Mm. Find something interesting in it. Watch the news. Have a conversation about politics. You know, them things there. Like, actually go out and experience other things in your local park. Like, maybe pick up a tennis racket and play tennis or go and play football. It's like those little simple things rather than just being in the house all of the time doing yeah. the same thing. Because yeah. I know that even, like, in my own family circles, like, it's just normal to go home, go shopping, go home again, eat food, go shopping, go home again. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just a, a circle of stuff, whereas you could kind of break that out by saying, do you know what? Let's go and do something different. So let's go to a yeah, museum, yeah. a free one. Let's go to a cafe. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's it's not, like, a lot. Yeah. You don't have to do a lot, but just be supportive. And And most schools offer, like, generally there's always something on offer because I remember if if I didn't go to school I would have never went to a museum because we yeah. do museum trips I never been to a museum outside of school really? as, and, until my adult until I became an adult and I started going on my own yeah. but like if it was just me and my mum we're not going to no museum <laughs> <laughs> like that's not happening um and even like the school trips like school trips were a powerful thing um I think if you remember in year eight, we did year eight camp. So just a bit of context here. Year eight camp, we basically, we, we went somewhere. I can't remember, but we basically did camping for a week. I can't remember where we went, <laughs> but it was a bunch of 12 year olds in a camp. They let us do whatever we wanted pretty much. And it was a wild time. But like, that was like, for me, that was like a big deal. Like yeah. it was like, it was so socially, I think it was just so different from what I was so used to. Mm. And they just let us kind of be in tents, like in sleeping bags in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. I never, I, ne I would never do that. That's not something I would ever do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, the, the financial side of things does affect kids because we had to pay to do that, right? Yeah. There's going to be kids who parents are like, I can't even afford to send you to this. Mm -hmm. So. It's a structural problem. Yeah. Because. But it is, it really irks me that there are a group of children who've been able to do things like go skiing with their school. They've gone to China with their school. Mm -hmm. And then there's another group of children, much larger group, who have never even gone outside of the city limits, their borough yeah. with their school because they haven't had the resources to. Yeah. That is a structural problem. So as much as like... You know, some parents might be able to facilitate those things. Some parents might have the interest, the money, whatever else. At the end of the day, like, if there are some things against you. Yeah, it's not, yeah, yeah. it's like certain things you can't do. Because even I've got a friend who never went on holiday until last year. Yeah. He's 25 and he's mm -hmm. never been on holiday. And in my mind, I'm not some, as a kid, I didn't go on a lot of holidays. But I went on, an, I went on a holiday yeah. every now and then a lot of year gaps in between, but I went on holiday and obviously because I played football, I got to travel a lot as well. I went to a lot of countries because of football. So to me, in my mind, being 25 and never going on holiday, I'm thinking, wow, yeah, like <laughs> wow, that's just know? mad. Yeah, like how'd yeah. you do that? Like that's, to me, it's mad. One thing I want to say though, is um, actually two things I'd like to say. The first being um, as a parent, engage with the school. Mm. Like you need to make sure you engage with the school. So that means like the smallest thing. If you see a missed call, if you see a call and you can answer it, hello, what's going on? It could be anything from the ch your child's broken their ankle to, I just want to say they were amazing in school today. And knowing that your parent will pick up the phone and interact with your teachers and has a relationship with your teachers actually helps the child feel safer because they know that there right. is like a community There's, inside yeah, and outside. Yeah. Um, and it's better than just being like, call my mom. She's not going to answer anyway. Or why is school calling me? Blah, blah, blah. Do you know what I'm saying? Interact, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interactive school because at the end of the day, as you said, like the children spend eight a.m. to like four 
with these teachers, with these people. So it needs to be a full circle. Mm -hmm. If it's fragmented, you're just, it's just going to be hard for the child. It's going to be hard for you. It's going to be hard for the teachers. Do you know what I'm saying? To interact with school. And secondly, I'm really hurt because I've got, I teach some kids who have been to more places than me. Really? Yeah. So I think it does kind of come down to what a priority is in the family as well. Yeah. Because some of them are flying out to like Japan and places. Really? Yeah, just just for jokes. But then that's what I'm saying. (laughs) But I think it does depend on like what the family sees as important because they will see traveling as important and, you know, school's just school. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, I want to talk a little bit about now that you're kind of, about stuff kind of outside of your secondary school experience. Yeah. Obviously you went to uni. What uni did you go to? Manchester. Manchester. So I want to talk mainly about kind of overcoming self-doubt and that building that resilience as an adult um, and, you know, things you faced. You don't have to talk necessarily about uni, but just your adulthood in general. Um, you don't have to talk specifically about situations, but how have you sort of dealt with self-doubt, maybe not feeling the best about yourself? Like how has that journey as an adult been for you? Um, if I even talk about myself briefly, like like I was saying before, I don't think there's ever been a time where I haven't believed in myself. Yeah. And But I think that can go two ways because you can be incredibly naive and a bit short-sighted because you just think that you can do everything but I still have that in me and I think that for me it's just come from just playing some playing sports and just I don't know I think if you if you play sports and you don't believe in yourself you're never gonna be Mm. as good as you could be and that mentality has just kind of just been in everything I do so like when I make content when I'm coaching people I'm just like you know I, I try to instill that in everybody else. Yeah. Because in my mind, I believe everybody can do everything. And that's just my, how I see it. And I don't know why I can't unsee that. I just, I just see someone, I'm like, you can do it. You just have to believe you can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so as an adult, anytime I've, the only time I've really felt uncertainty is literally like a short term sort of when I'm performing, like playing, playing actual sport. Yeah. If I'm playing football and I'm not playing well, in my mind, I'm like, oh shit, like maybe I'm not as good as I think I am. But as soon as I do something good, I'm like, nah, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm I'm as good as I think I am. Yeah. So like, how have you as an adult sort of dealt with anything like that in terms of like self-doubt, not feeling the best about yourself, like anything like that? I think if I'm honest with you, like, I'm kind of in the thick of it now. Do you right. know what I mean? Like navigating that. You still feel that now? Yeah, because I... I feel that I've kind of like broken up my experiences in two parts. Like the first being when I knew I was good academically for our maths. Like I knew I was like good at all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so I was able to like go through that, go to the uni that I wanted to, whatever else. Um, and even though I would have self-doubt, it was because people were telling me, Oh, you're good at this, like you're good at writing these essays. All you need to do is like fix your language here make sure you're linking this argument to this one, blah, blah, blah. So I knew that I had the formula and I could do it and I had potential. And I I was proud of the work that I was like presenting. That self-doubt wasn't that big at Mm. the time because I was like, it's not like I'm aiming to pass, I'm aiming to exceed. So it wasn't a matter of, let's say, I'm so rubbish, I'm never going to pass or do anything. It was a matter of, okay, how do I get the best I possibly can how do I nurture my skills and even though like yeah I didn't get to the place I wanted to be going to uni I still got to the uni I wanted to so I think for me the self-doubt was I was able to manage that because I've already as we said before believed in myself and that's because other people were like telling me that right the negative thing now though is um with moving away from like strictly academic commitments like university and being in like this whole wilderness of a career and having to navigate your way through actually being an adult, like 25 plus, um, you're, you're your own cheerleader. And I have really struggled with it. Okay. Yeah, I've really struggled because there's no one telling you, okay, 
You just need to do this differently. There's right. no one mentoring you. There's no one checking on you. There's no positive reinforcement. You can do that yourself. So one thing that I noticed is a negative element of people being like, you can do this and you're going to get an A, blah, 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 is I am heavily reliant on external validation. Right, okay. Yeah. So now, like, the battle is with self-doubt. You know, you might be telling yourself, oh, you're not as good as this person with this. You're not as organised, which I know I'm not, like there's all these issues that you start to identify about yourself outside of your comfort zone, outside of what you've been prepped and nurtured to do for 18 years prior. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, so it's like, I don't need that external validation. I don't need someone that I'm in the back. And that's really hard because you've just, that's what you've grown on. Yeah, that's what and you're used to. Yeah, to translate that to some, like a different context, even though obviously my work is academic because I teach, it's not, quite the same because there are so many different interactions and skills and like right. commitments that you have to do. Yeah. Um, and even like with personal stuff, like self-doubt with other things outside of work is popping because you're like, I've never done this before. Right. So I think it's just about being mindful of there are going to be voices in your head that are telling you that you aren't good enough. Yeah. That you might not have had the earliest start as like this person and you can play yourself to others. But I always remind myself that like everyone's journey, everyone's journey is different. It's different, yeah. And then like I check myself and I've even got on my screensaver now when it comes to like me self-doubting, like I've put questions on it saying, are you doing this because you're self-sabotaging yourself? <laughs> and like, are you being slow because of this? And just take your time though. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Just because when self-doubt hits, that's when I start like procrastinating. That's where I start kind of like, self-sabotaging and traumatizing myself yeah and one thing that I, I picked up from another podcast um was I think it was Ruby Kill, Ruby Kill who said this she was like is this useful so if the task or the thinking so like my self-doubt and me sitting there stewing over it and feeling sorry for myself is getting too intense is it useful mm-hmm. no x y and z it's not useful at all like so let me just stop how am I gonna manage this now and how am I gonna move on yeah And I think with the self-sabotage kind of point you made, um, it's something I say to my clients, right? So all my clients, sometimes I'll get, I'll get a client that, you know, they miss one workout. So the system that I use, I can see when they're missing workouts, right? So if they miss a workout, I can see they got like a big red X next to their (laughs) name. And I might, if they miss one, sometimes I won't make a comment. Yeah. They miss two. I can see, I get a notification. So I'll make a comment and, and then, but sometimes I'll, I'll miss it. Cause I've got a few, I've got a decent amount of clients. So I don't, sometimes I miss it. Right. So we do a weekly check-in every week we do a check-in. So on a Sunday I'm going through the check-in or a Monday and I can see they missed three workouts. They only did one workout and they'll comment. They might put something in a check-in like, Oh, I missed one workout and it's just messed up my whole week or I had a cake and it just I just messed up my whole week with my diet. And in my mind, I'm thinking, all right, in my mind, me as a person, if I do one thing wrong, I'm going to try and correct it. That's just how I see things. And I, I also think that comes from sports, right? I just like when you're playing football, if I miss a shot, you know, I'm, I'm going to wait and get the next one right. Yeah. That's kind of how I see it. Mm. Or if I miss a header, I'm going to make sure I get the next one. Um, so I apply that to my training. So I, I always use this analogy to them. I say to them, look, if you're driving a car and you get one flat tire, are you going to stop the car, get out and slash the other three tires? You're never going to do that, right? That is true. No one ever does that. Yeah. You're never going to do that. So if you had 10 biscuits, a Coke, and I don't know, some chips one day, Are you just going to be like, all right, I messed up one day. I'm going to eat the same thing for the next three days. Mm. No, one, one, you're allowed to have one bad day, right? Yeah. So just like you can have one flat tire, but what you would do is you turn around and try and fix that one flat tire. Same thing applies. Self-sabotage. You're not going to go and slash the other three tires. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I, that's what I say to my clients. Um, And I really try and drive it home. I need to start finding another another analogy because I keep using that one. So I'm going to find another one. But it makes sense though, isn't it? It It makes sense because for me, I think that a lot of people, they get hung up when they, they they, they get hung up when they get one thing wrong Mm -hmm. or 
they mess up. Maybe even, even if you have a bad week, even if you look at it from a larger perspective, you have one bad week, right? There's 30, 31 or 30 days in a month. If I have one bad week, I've still got 23 or 24 days. One week is nothing. I can still make it up. Um, so yeah, when you mentioned that self-sabotage, that kind of, I literally had this conversation with someone today as well, yeah. someone that you know. So it's quite interesting that you said that. Um, cool. It's real. <laughs> it is, no, it is real, it is real. So obviously Spectrum Health is all about health and fitness. I know that you work out. So how is exercise and training, how does that play a role in your life? Um, even like, is, is there a correlation between when training's going well and outside and, you know, how does that affect things outside of that? Um, or when training's not going well, how does that affect you? You know, like. I mean, my relationship with training is so irritating for me because I wish I was more consistent. Right. Um, um, I think for me, I really start to notice difference when I have slapped off for like two weeks. And actually, I'm really glad to hear you say about that. If you have like one week or <laughs> like a one bad week, you can pick it back up because that gives me a lot of kind of like hope and faith. Um, but I can really tell my energy levels and my mood when I haven't been exercising. Right. Because I am just the worst. It's like, a difference, right? I'm already like all over the place anyway, but I can tell I feel my body feels a bit more like lead and I feel a little bit more irritable. I feel like I'm just giving up and being like, oh, forget it. I'm not going to have a jacket potato tonight. I'm going to have chips, as you said. Like, do you know, I give up. And then it's a bit of a slog to do that first workout, whether it's home or at the gym. You're a bit like, oh, I'm not as strong as I was two weeks ago. And I've let all these gains go, whatever else. And you don't feel like you want to do it. But then once you've done it and you've done that side, it's the best feeling. Oh, <laughs> I'm you like, feel better, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I needed it. And then I'm good for like two weeks and then it happens again. But I think that's, again, something in my control. Yeah. I always blame work. Work is very demanding. I work like an hour and a half away. It takes a long time. Um, but I definitely need to be a bit more consistent with it. Right. And I just feel better. Yeah. Mentally, I feel better physically, obviously. Like, it's just... So you would say that when you when you are consistent, when things are mm. going well in the gym, you can feel the difference. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I, I just feel better about myself. Yeah. Like, I feel that the gym needs to be a permanent part of my life forever. Yeah. Like, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen in the next five days even. But, you know, it needs to be a part of my life. Like, yeah. I do not want to be an older person who feels like they have wasted their physicality. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? It sounds really bad. But like, I want to make sure that I use my body to the best of its ability yeah, whilst I can. For sure. Do you know what I'm sure. saying? Um, and it's just good for you mentally as well. Yeah, for sure. I would say, I would say, yeah, I definitely think that, I don't know, I, I've i had times where I didn't train at all. And although it's very rare, I do remember there was one particular moment when I was in America and we, I came home for Christmas and usually because in america when you're playing college sports over there it's quite it's so intense mm. you don't really get a break so when they when you get a christmas break usually i would still run or i'd still do something right but this one particular christmas i just said i'm going to take these whole 30 days and do nothing oh. i promise you i didn't work out didn't run didn't do nothing i never done that before in my life like yeah. i've never gone 30 days straight and not done anything but this one time i don't know what i was thinking I just didn't do anything and I, I enjoyed it. Like, I, I don't get me wrong, I enjoyed it. But that first workout when I got back, oh my, I could have died, honestly. <laughs> honestly, I could have died. Like, I could have died. It was crazy. So, yeah. Just be consistent with it. Yeah. It's hard, like, things can get in the way, but it's just worth it. Being consistent is, is the key. Honestly, yeah. consistency gets results. That's something I always say. Um, that's something I always say because I, I, th I think another thing is... Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that picture, right? Where there's two guys, two cartoon characters and they're mining towards the gold and one guy's yes. mining yeah. and the gold's right there and the other guy's turning around. Yeah. And sometimes when, when you're training and you're getting in shape, right? Some people, they they get disheartened if the scale wasn't showing them what they want or, mm -hmm. you know, they're not seeing what they want, but they've been doing something for like six weeks or something. And it's like, they're so close 
and they're so close. They almost clocked it, but they just quit. Yeah. They just quit. They're just like, all right, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop tracking my food or I'm going to stop yeah. going to the gym because they're not seeing it, but they're like, they've almost clocked it. So that's why I always tell people like, yo, don't be that guy. You're missing out on the gold. Just keep going. Definitely. Like keep going. The worst thing you can do, the worst thing you can do is just stop. And uh, that's now I know like in my, in my, in my life, I will never go 30 days without training. I could, I could go a week obviously yeah. and injuries happen, but I don't think I could ever go 30 days because I just think that once I stop, I'm making it so much harder for myself and I'm going to miss out on the gold. One thing, though, that I do want to say is obviously, you know, as a woman, it's difficult. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? There are certain times of the month where doing that workout that you did three weeks ago and you smashed it and you felt powerful, like you're on top of the world. It ain't happening. Yeah. You got, you're train, in a you got a train. Yeah, you got a train around your cycle. As yeah, a woman. that's it. And um, I was again, I was listening to another podcast um the other day, and they were speaking about like the effect of your your cycle yeah. on exercise and knowing your body and knowing yeah. what you can and can't do, but also maximizing what you can. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think that's really important. So I think my relationship with training definitely corresponds to that because I feel like yeah, yeah. that's heavy, and that really impacts my motivation yeah and so, you know yeah. like during your luteal phase mm. so before you're about to be due you know your body your body temperature increases yeah. so you might have more cravings you know you might not feel as strong in a workout so really what people should do or what women should do is like well firstly they should track their cycle well, they sh- if they want to they should track their cycle yeah. and then you know if they know where they if they know roughly where their luteal phase is going to be you got to adjust your training to kind of make up for that mm. in a sense where what I usually recommend is don't kill yourself in the workouts and eat more food and that that might help you feel better eat more food. yeah I didn't know that. you bump up your calories maybe I 200 300 calories <laughs> and then don't try and kill yourself on the workouts do what you can yeah and that that will help you keep going instead of just saying I'm not going to train the whole week still do a little yeah. bit and you'll be you'll be good still do do what you can yeah bump up your calories 100 200 calories and you'll be good I think like yoga is a good one to do. Yeah, like anything that's going to keep you moving. I think the worst thing you can do is just do nothing. Yeah. But, you know, I'm not a woman, so I don't know what it feels like. So I'm not going to tell you what to do. <laughs> I'm only going to give it's advice from what I've read. Especially when you've got like the quick things like wine and chocolate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. It's really difficult. Yeah. So, yeah, cool. All right, then. So it's been a pleasure. But before we end this... I want you to, I want to ask you about any projects, anything you're doing outside of teaching. Um, what have you got? What are you doing? What's like, what are you pushing yourself through right now? Um, so what I'm pushing myself through is actually doing my podcast and teach, yeah. which obviously like we've had a conversation about, it's been quite challenging with the cross rates of work and stuff. Yeah. But um, what Gen Teacher's mission is, is to kind of widen the discussions that I had within teaching there are so many salient issues like race, sexuality, um, gender, all those types of things there that educators are just sometimes too scared to talk about. Yeah. So I'm going to use sexuality again. I, We had a conversation in our latest episode about why it's considered as such a taboo, especially for teachers to be out and to come out. And actually, wow. like, um, not too long ago, I think it was this year. Yeah, definitely this year. Um, the first known head teacher, St. Dunstan's actually in Catford, okay. came out as gay. And wow. that hit the news in 2021 yeah. that a head teacher came out as gay to his students. Like, that says a lot about how sexuality is treated yeah. within education, yeah. but there's still, like, no one's having those conversations to be like, why? What yeah. do we do to tackle it? Yeah. Because people are too scared. And I feel that one massive thing that's, like, calling me at the moment is just challenging all of the taboo that comes with being an educator, right? Especially when it comes to like body positivity yeah. and what is expected of you as a teacher, like what you're expected to look like, to sound like, to be like. Mm. Even like when it comes to Love Island, for example, teaching is like one of the only professions where you're legit barred from going on there. People say you'll never be able to teach again. And I understand obviously you work with children, but doctors and lawyers are all up and there all the yeah, time. That's true. Why 
why can't a teacher who also has had like a similar upbringing to all these other people and whatever else why can't they make that choice with their future just yeah. because someone else said so do you know what I mean so it's like talking about all of that and trying to like break the the norms in education that are just so just reductive and yeah. draconian yeah so that's what I'm doing at the moment okay cool mm-hmm. for those of you who may be interested in listening to that I'll put the social media and such in the description um so yeah, thank you for coming on episode one, my first guest. <laughs> uh, hopefully we'll continue as we mean to start. So yeah. this will be the best one. So we need to continue having good uh, podcast episodes. Um, I really appreciate you coming, joining at this late time. Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed this conversation. And I could have said more. Honestly. Yeah, like I know. I feel like we could keep, you could even keep going. Yeah, like. <laughs> But no, I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, Guys, like, subscribe, do all those things. Um, And yeah, I'm out. Peace. Bye.